started off as a normal day for our first patient has ended up with a trip to accident and emergency. Luckily, they've come to the right place for you. At Royal Manchester Children's Hospital, there's a new admission. Eight-year-old Charlie. I've got a big hole in my head. Right, that explains the big plaster then. I've got a new bite and it's fast and a crash. I think we need the details, don't you? Charlie was outside with his twin brother. I thought we were the only twins on this show. Afraid not, Zand. So they were trying a few tricks on their brand new bikes. But what's missing from this picture? Helmets? You got it. Anyway, they spotted a staircase and came up with a cunning plan. Ooh, traffic lights. On your marks. Get set. They're not, are they? And go. That looks dangerous. Yes, and not surprisingly, Charlie lost control and went flying. Jumbo jet. Parachutist. And a bird. Crikey, this is a long way down. And he landed, whacking his head on some railings. Ouch. It was like rain dropping, but in blood. Ew. Let's check out that holy head. Enter Dr Omar Amin. Now then, young man, can you tell me what's happened to you today? Um, I was playing outside on my bike and my handlebars turned and made me crash into this metal fence and, oh dear. and I banged my head. How's your bike? It's good. Is it still in one piece? Hang on, this isn't a bike hospital. Let's get a look at that hole. Prepare yourself, everyone. Ooh, yeah, it's a big one. It's gone quite deep, hasn't it? It's gone really deep. I'd say so. It's about one and a half centimetres long, but it's really, really deep, and it's gone right down to his bone, and if you open up the cut, you can actually see down to his skull. To show you what Dr Omar is talking about, there's some gross blood coming up. If you're squeamish, look away for one second now. OK, all clear. Charlie's forehead is made up of five layers of skin and tissue. The hole in his head goes through all of that to his skull. And did you know when you're born, your skull is made up of 44 separate bony elements? But as you grow, many of them join up to make solid bones, like the frontal bone. And that's what we can see in Charlie's injury. So what I propose we do is give it a good wash and a clean, make sure there's not going to be any infection there. And then what we'll do is pop some stitches in for him. Before the stitching can start, Nurse Louise applies anaesthetic gel to numb Charlie's cut. There we go. Hold on. Thank you. You're very, very welcome, sweetheart. And leaves it to work its magic. We have to get your head fixed, don't we? You could be a model one day, couldn't you? No. Why? What do you want to be? Cycler. You're not being a cycler. <laughs> yeah, nice try, Charlie. But I think Mum's going to take a bit of convincing. Anyway, let's leave that anaesthetic to numb your head and we'll be back later to see how you're getting on. Ouch. And now to our lab, where we put our bodies to the test to show you how your body works. Ah, that really hurts. Just don't try anything like this at home. Today, we're looking at our wee. Where have you been? I've been for a pee. This is my urine. It's light yellow and it doesn't smell much. That's because I've drunk lots of water. But Chris hasn't. No, I haven't drunk lots of water and this is my urine. It's dark coloured, it's strong smelling and it really hurt to pee. And that's because I'm dehydrated. But what is we? Well, it's made by your kidney. Every day, they work hard to get rid of waste products called toxins and hold on to water that's needed to make your body work. Your wee is the mixture of those waste toxins and any leftover water. Now we've got an experiment where we're going to separate the water from the toxins in Chris's urine. And then Chris is going to drink it. What? This may seem like a terrible idea, but Chris won't actually be drinking wee. He'll be drinking pure water extracted from it. So as we heat the urine, the water vapour is evaporating and boiling off here and then being cooled by the liquid in this tube and then just dripping out there. Right now, your kidneys are busy separating out water from waste toxins. Only they don't need all this kit, they just do it naturally. It's amazing, isn't it? In just this tiny distance, you go from filthy, disgusting, undrinkable urine just along this tube and into clear, refreshing, 
delicious water. I mean, that is amazing, isn't it? And if that was water your kidneys had separated out, it would now be distributed to all your organs and muscles to keep them working properly. It doesn't smell like water. Oh, no, it doesn't. You're still going to have to drink it, though. You told everyone you would. I didn't say to anyone I was going to drink it. Well, I'm not going to drink it. It's not my urine. Fine, I will drink it. <laughs> I can't believe he drank it. <laughs> Actually, it smells bad, but it doesn't taste bad. Which I'm very happy about. Without water, your body simply wouldn't work. And you can help your kidneys do the best job they can just by drinking plenty of water every day. If you're weeing regularly and it's light in colour, you'll know you're helping your body. Ouch. If you're in need of medical help fast, there are teams of paramedics near you ready to assist. We're going on call with the UK's emergency services, heading into the thick of the action to help save lives. I'm heading out in this state-of-the-art rapid response vehicle to show you more about the life-saving work these paramedics do. This fast medical service is on standby 24 hours a day, ready to help you in an emergency. On call with me today is paramedic Jan Van. And a new call has just come in. I got a call to a 66-year-old man who's apparently fighting for breath. So this is lots of reasons why you can be short of breath. It could be a problem with either his lungs or his heart. It could have an infection, it could be heart failure, all sorts of different things. We arrive on the scene and Janice got us there fast in just three and a half minutes. Our patient is called James. No, He's struggling for breath, so Jan gets to work quickly. Right, let's have a quick look at your oxygen levels. I'm going to listen to your chest. You sound pretty quiet in there, so... Although well, she said his chest is quiet, which you might think is good. In fact, that means there isn't much air getting in. Normally, you can hear the air rushing in and out. The fact that his chest is quiet isn't good. The other thing is she's put a monitor on him, which is looking at the level of oxygen in his blood. Now, it should normally be between 95 and 100%. At the moment, it's 85%, so that's significantly less than we'd expect. Now, it looks like he's breathing smoke. What he's actually got is oxygen that's bubbling through a drug. It's called a nebulizer, and it's designed to open up his airways. It's commonly used for people with asthma. Helps them breathe much better. Did it just come on when you woke up this morning? No, it's going on and off the last couple of days. Oh, really? With James having had difficulty breathing for a couple of days, it's really important to find the cause. So what Jan's doing now is measuring what's called his peak flow. That's how fast he can breathe air out of his lungs. Brilliant. What that tells us is how much resistance there is to his breathing. Is that helping us all with the breathing? It is. Good. Although the nebulizer is helping James to breathe easier, he'll need further tests to find out why this keeps happening. So an ambulance crew arrived to take him to hospital. But that nebulizer's worked to treat, it's worked see, straight away. You see a, a big effect with the nebulizer, yeah. don't you? Yeah. yeah. The thing is with breathing problems, it can go wrong quite quickly, they can deteriorate really quickly. So the sooner they go into hospital, then the better. As James leaves in the ambulance, we get ready for the next call out. With rapid response teams like this all over the UK, it means that expert medical care can be with you in minutes of a serious emergency. Still to come. A spot! I find out more about the body's largest organ, the skin. We show you a trick to amaze your friends with. And discover why I'm staying well away from that snake. Now, did you know there are up to 400 joints in your body? They sit between your bones, and without them, you'd only be able to move your eyebrows and your tongue. That's amazing. And so's this. An ordinary warehouse full of boxes. I can see that, Chris. And this is a clear plastic box. Again, I can see that. But what's it doing here? And who's this? You'll see. She's hiding an amazing body skill. She's very bendy. She is indeed. And you're about to find out what she can do. Now, you'll notice she's a lot bigger than that box. Ooh. Is she gonna...? No, she's not, is she? Yes, she is. This is Delia Dussol, and she's a contortionist, a professional acrobatic performer who's trained herself to fit into unbelievably small spaces. So how does Delia's amazing body do this? 
Well, inside Delia's limbs, she has super stretchy ligaments. That's the soft tissue that holds our bones together. Although she was born this way, Delia trains hard every day to make sure her ligaments remain flexible. But this isn't something to try at home. It's fine to practice um, flexible moves at home, but um, I wouldn't recommend squeezing yourself into small spaces. That's because if you get it wrong, you can get stuck and seriously injure yourself. In fact, there are very few people in the world able to bend their bodies this way, and it takes years of training and practice to achieve a body skill like this. Now that's amazing. It's not amazing, Zand. Let's head back to the emergency department to see what the latest is with our patient. In Manchester, eight-year-old Charlie is in hospital with a hole in his head. Charlie was out riding his bike with his twin brother when they had an idea for a race. Only it was down some stairs. And they weren't wearing any helmets. They set off, bumpity bumpity bump, when all of a sudden, Charlie lost his grip and went flying through the air. Oh, mind the bird. Whacking his head on some railings. It was like rain dropping, but in blood. The wound has been numbed with anaesthetic gel, and now it's time to fix that head. But before the stitching can begin, the team need to make Charlie comfortable. And what we're going to do is put some magic gas on, and it makes you feel a little bit woozy. The gas Charlie is breathing in is known as laughing gas. It makes you relaxed and stops you feeling any pain, meaning Dr Omar can get to work. First, the deeper tissue is sewn up with dissolvable stitches. You're doing so well, Charlie. So well, in fact, his mind's on something else entirely. I'm still starving, actually. You're still starving? <laughs> it's an interesting time to be thinking about food, but when a guy's got to eat, a guy's got to eat. You'll have to wait a bit longer yet, though, mate, cos we've got to tackle the top layer now. And it's fixed. It's fixed. Yep, one forehead fixed and a patched-up patient ready to go. Thank you. Nice one, Charlie. Thank you very much. I enjoyed that because it tickled a bit. Tickled? Must have been that laughing gas. I'm very pleased with the way that the stitches have come together and I think that in a, in a few weeks' time you shouldn't really be able to see much of a scar. Well, it's good news and I'm sure Charlie's learned his lesson. Do you need to wear a helmet yeah. while you're on grass? What do you think? Yes. Phew, oh. you had us worried there for a moment. So, Charlie heads off home with a nice new head. Bye, Charlie. Ouch! We've got loads of amazing body tricks to show you. Here's how to fool your friend's taste buds. This is a good trick, and all you need is a tongue. But the tongue has to be dry, so that's what I'm going to do with this kitchen towel. Now I'm going to take a piece of food, chocolate, and put it on Zand's tongue. Without looking at his tongue, let's see if Zand can guess what the food is. Can you tell me what that is? Is it itchy? You've lost your keys. Oh, cheese, why didn't you say? Now, the reason Zahn can't taste it is because the molecules in food that give it flavour need to be dissolved in saliva before you can detect them. OK, Zahn, chew it up in your mouth. So, can you tell me what it is? Chocolate. That's right. And could you taste it with the dry tongue? No. Chris has found a way to take away the taste of chocolate. Why would you do that? You know how much I like chocolate. So, in order for food to have a taste, it must be dissolved in saliva first. Only then can the flavour be detected by our taste buds. Give it a try and see if you can trick your friends. Ouch. Now it's time for Chris to show you a hospital department you've never seen before. Normally, this would be a disaster, but today I'm on duty at the skin clinic so I can get this checked out. And Nurse Debbie Woodcock is ready for emergencies just like this. Right, so now I'm just going to have a look at it with my magnifying glass, which looks this. right into your skin. OK? Yeah, that just looks like a simple pimple. It's not the Absolutely worst you've ever seen. Nothing to worry about. I really want to squeeze it. Don't squeeze oh. your spots. No, because what if your hands aren't clean? And then you go like that and go. And all the gunge comes out of the spot like we want it to, but all your fingers, under all your nails, you might have lots of germs. And then when you squeeze it, all the pus might go out, but then you've left a hole and all the germs might go in. 
So what you're saying is, I'm going to have to live with this for another couple of days. Yeah, oh, Chris, it's just a simple pimple. I think you'll survive. OK, enough about my skin complaint. At the dermatology unit, they look at skin. It's our largest organ, and it provides a protective layer all over our bodies. But, like anything in the human body, things can go wrong. Rachel comes into the clinic with some very sore patches on her legs. Nurse Sophie Dolman takes a look. So this is typical of eczema, and that mm -hmm. layer of skin that keeps the moisture in isn't working, and so your skin is really um, dehydrated. <laughs> eczema is a very common problem. It makes the skin dry, itchy and sore, and bad patches can get infected if not looked after properly. So, Rachel, you've tried lots of creams and they haven't worked, so why, why haven't the creams that Rachel's tried previously They haven't worked? been strong enough, basically. Help is at hand with a special moisturising treatment. Tibby and Amy have put on some very, very strong moisturising cream and some steroids onto the eczema, and the steroids are going to damp down the inflammation, and they work better if they're kept against the skin. And now they're bandaging it all up, because otherwise everything would get very greasy. Next in is Daniel, who's had a rare skin condition since birth, which causes his skin to blister very easily. It's not infectious, but it is serious, and the symptoms need to be kept under control. I can see that you've got dry skin on your, on your face and on your neck and on your hands. Why have you got the dry skin? My skin produces too much on my joint and doesn't produce enough where it looks normal. What kind of things does it stop you doing? Uh, I went allowed to do PE in school. When I like walk far, I, I come out in blisters and on your feet. Yeah, yeah. Okay. My, my feet are the worst bit. Can you show me where where you've got the the condition? My elbows, my hands. So you're making too much skin. Yeah. So this is Dan's hand. This is my hand. And everywhere there are creases, everywhere the skin folds on Dan's hand, he makes too much skin. And this is what he has to rub off with the moisturising cream. Obviously, this is quite a tough thing to live with. How do you how do you manage? I just get on with it and cope the best I can with it. Do you ever get self-conscious about it? No, it's no point. Yeah. It's just part of me, innit? So although Dan's skin condition can't be cured, he'll still come to the clinic regularly. He's given the treatments that he'll continue for the rest of his life, and that enables him to both cope with the pain and deal with the skin. OK, right. Okay. Good to see you again, Danny. See you later. Finally, Molly comes in for a checkup on her eczema after receiving the same treatment as Rachel a few weeks ago. She's been following a moisturising regime at home. So, Molly, I haven't seen you for four weeks. How's your eczema? It's nearly gone. Nearly gone? Can you show me? Yeah. So it was bad on the knee, was it? Yeah. And th how much better is this now? Much better, because last time I came, it was all red and it had all gone really dry. So are there lots of different ways of treating eczema? Do you have to treat different children differently? Yeah, and everybody's different, so what, cre what one cream will work for one person won't work for another, so unfortunately, with the amount of creams there are, it is a bit of trial and error. And with Molly, it looks like you've found the right moisturising cream, and you're feeling quite good about all this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How much does the average adult skin weigh? Is it as much as A, one fully grown pug dog, B, two newborn babies, or C, three pineapples? The answer is C. Three pineapples weigh just under three kilos, and so does the average adult skin. Ouch. Zand. Yes? Hold this. Ah! A plastic snake! These things are terrifying. Yes, but what if the snake was real? This is a case for investigation. Ouch! As a doctor specialising in tropical medicine, I'm used to working in some exotic locations with dangerous creatures. But today, I'm on the top floor of the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. And in fact, this is one of the most dangerous locations I've ever been in, because on this floor are 180 of the world's deadliest snakes. There are many species of snake here, and each one is capable of delivering a potentially life-threatening dose of venom, a poisonous fluid snakes inject through their fangs. Now, if you're wondering who on earth would volunteer to work with these deadly snakes, meet Dr Robert Harrison. Why are you keeping 180 venomous snakes in this room? We take venom from these snakes, and that venom is used to make medicines to treat people who would otherwise die from snake bite. That life-saving medicine is known as anti-venom, and it's actually made using the snake venom itself. 
The anti-venom medicine Dr. Robert and his team are helping to make in Liverpool is used to treat people 4,000 miles away in West Africa, where there are 36,000 deaths every year from snake venom. Meet Paul Rowley, an expert snake handler who's brought some snakes out of their habitat for us to see in action. Well, this is the Nigerian sawscale viper, and it's the, um, amongst the most dangerous snakes in the world to man. Even though they are small, they are an extremely dangerous snake. They do kill a lot of people. Because anti-venom medicine is made using snake venom, Dr. Robert and Paul have to collect that venom from the snake's mouth. But it's a dangerous business. When the snake bites the dish like this, the poisonous venom drips out of the fangs and is collected. It's a bit like milking a cow, and it doesn't hurt the snake. And Rob, what would happen if instead of a glass dish, this was human flesh? Once it gets into the blood, it causes terrific bleeding throughout the body. The poor patient is just bleeding from everywhere, from the nose, from the gums, from the eyes, and internally. For such a little snake, it can cause a lot of harm. And this small drop of venom that we've just collected is more than enough to kill a human being. But it's also enough to make the anti-venom that will save people's lives. If you're squeamish, look away now. This is a 12-year-old boy who was bitten on the foot by a Nigerian saw-scaled viper. He lost his big toe, but the anti-venom saved his life. Each snake has a different type of venom and needs its own anti-venom to be made. So, ready for another? This one is seriously fantastic. This is a Nigerian puff adder. So the snake has just bitten the mat, and that's just one of the problems of, of doing this, is this is a very, very tricky thing to do. This adder's venom has a different effect on the human body to the previous snake. A terrific destruction of the tissues around the bite. It just destroys the, the muscle and the skin. So this venom actually dissolves flesh, Absolutely. and then it spreads around the body and, and then it spreads around the body. Yeah. This is a seven-year-old boy who was bitten on the hand by a Nigerian puff adder while he was cutting grass. The venom caused blood-filled blisters to erupt, but he made a full recovery thanks to the anti-venom. But not all snakes release their venom by biting. This snake is extremely quick and it can spit its venom. And that's why it's called the spitting cobra. In fact, it can spit as far as two metres. And if it was to get in your eyes, it could blind you. So Dr Robert's got his face guard on and I'm staying well away to let the experts collect the venom. Ooh. You're just milking the venom glands there. Just massaging the venom glands. Now, don't worry, it's highly unlikely you'll ever need the anti-venom being made here. We don't have any snakes like that in England, do we? We don't. We're really lucky we don't have anything like the, the cobras or the, or the puff adders and things like that. But we do have the British adder, and it it's, is actually a really quite important snake. There was a, a near-death case two years ago. So because when you're going out, just stay clear of these snakes. Don't handle them, don't touch them, leave them alone. Rob, I think after today, that advice is extremely obvious. I'm going to stay well back. <laughs> <laughs> that was spectacular. And remember, the venom that Rob and Paul risked their lives to collect today in Liverpool will be used to make anti-venom, and that will be used to save people who've been bitten by snakes in Africa. In the Accident and Emergency Department, the team are ready for their next case. Let's meet him. This is nine-year-old Ahmed. He's a sight for sore eyes. I hit my eyebrow on the window, so when I woke up the next day, my eyebrow had a big bump and I couldn't open it. I bet that caused a few raised eyebrows at home. Not yours, though, Ahmed, obviously. So, how did it happen? Ahmed was at home, playing a video game. He was having fun when his big sister fancied a go. She tried to muscle her way in. Ah, sisterly love. Oh, three, two. Come on, the Blues. Ahmed stood his ground, but before he could take a shot at goal, she pushed him off the chair. Ouch. When I look down or when I look up, I, it hurts. I can only look straight. Luckily, Dr Rachel Jen is on hand to see what's up with that eye. What happened to your eye? I banged the eye in the window, sir. Then I looked in the mirror because I had a big bump here. Yep, that is a biggie. 
Ahmed's developed a periorbital hematoma, which is a much more impressive way of saying he's got a black eye. It's actually blood that turns a black eye black, caused by bleeding under the skin around the eye, leaving him with a right shiner. To be sure there's no serious damage, Dr Rachel begins a thorough examination. One of the first things we always do is check their eyesight. We'll cover up your good eye. And can you just start at the top of the chart and read the letters? H-B-A-U-S. So, Ahmed's eyesight is looking great, but there's more to check out than that. Behind your eye lies a bony socket holding your eyeball and lots of muscles and nerves that allow your eyes to move. And it's all these parts that Dr Rachel needs to examine for damage. First, she checks his eyeballs are reacting normally. Can you keep looking at my finger? Then she makes sure his eye socket isn't broken. That will be sore then. If I touch you on your cheek there, does it feel OK? Luckily, our eyes are quite well protected, so things are looking good for Ahmed. I don't think there's any damage to, to your actual eye. I think it's just your eyelid that's very, very bruised, and that will be sore like a bruise anywhere on your body. But it should get better by itself. There's no special treatment needed. Thank you. I'd steer clear of that sister of yours, though. Oh, is that her? No, no, different one. Well, this has been a real eye-opener for Ahmed. I've learned never to fight with my sister again. Smart move, smart move. Bye, Ahmed. <laughs>